Hey Bookworms, welcome back to my channel and welcome if you are new. My name is Antonisha Lachey and today we are talking about my summer anticipated releases. So, as you can see, wearing the same shirt. I think I explained it in my weekly reading wrap up. I am back recording, I think, one, two, three, four, five videos today. And so, Probably this entire week, every video you see, I will have this on and a couple of videos going into the next few weeks and next month. But anyways, let's get started because we have a lot of books to talk about. So today we're talking about my most anticipated summer releases. And for this, um, I decided to go with the true dates of summer. So we are going from June 20th through September 21st, which is actual summer. I know it's very specific, but it is what it is. Um, I have 18 books on this list that I want to talk about. Um, I am not going to like ramble trying to kind of guesstimate the, the synopses. I'm just, I have them all tagged on Storygraph as summer um, anticipated releases. So as I go through them, I'll just let you know the, the name, um, the date that it's coming out. I'll pop an image up here because obviously I don't have any of them. Um, and I will just read you the synopsis that um, Storygraph has. So let's go ahead and get started. First one, um, and also I have them grouped by the month that they're coming out, but some of them, the dates may be a little off. It's just as I found them. So like one that's coming out on the 15th may be before one that's coming out on the 7th, but I'm keeping them together with the month. So we are gonna start with two that are coming out at the end of June. The first one, of course, is Survive the Night by Riley Sager. I have pre-ordered this. Cannot wait for it to get here. I'm currently in the middle of doing a Riley Sager reading vlog, so that will get added to the file, um, and that will be the last one that I read in that reading vlog, and that will go up at some point in July. So um, I'm just going to read the synopsis. It says, it's November 1991. George H.W. Bush is in the White House. Nirvana is in the tape deck, and movie-obsessed college student Charlie Jordan is in a car with a man who might be a serial killer. <laughs> um yeah it says josh baxter the man behind the wheel is a virtual stranger to charlie they met at the campus ride board each looking to share the long drive home to ohio both have good reasons for wanting to get away for charlie it's guilt and grief over the murder of her best friend who became the third victim of the man known as the campus killer for josh it's to help care for his sick father or so he says like the hitchcock heroine she's named after charlie has her doubts there's something suspicious about josh from the holes in his story about his father to how he doesn't seem to want charlie to see inside the car's trunk as they travel an empty highway in the dead of night and increasingly worried charlie begins to think she's sharing a car with the campus killer is josh truly dangerous or is charlie's suspicion merely a figment of her mo her movie fueled imagination what follows is a game of cat and mouse played out on night shroud roads and in neon lit parking lots during an age when the only call for help can be made on a payphone and in a place where there's nowhere to run in order to win charlie must do one thing survive the night i am so here for this book i cannot wait for it i so mm, i cannot wait for it. i think the setting so the whole locked in you can't run you can't go anywhere is very appealing to me but also the time period because there's no cell phone so it's not like you can call somebody or send a quick text obviously if it was in present time then obviously we could always do all the phones dead or there's no reception but I think this is just so much cooler to eliminate cell phones completely um and all of that so it's literally you're stuck with him and you got to figure out how to survive I'm, I'm so excited for this one so excited um, the next one that I have, and I apologize for I'm looking to the side. I have my iPad set up here with my list and then I have my phone in my hand <laughs> story graph. So I'm all over the place. But the next one that is coming out on the 29th of June as well is The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. This is a historical fiction and not quite what I typically read, but I'm excited about this one. So it says, The remarkable little-known story of Bella da Costa Green, J.P. Morgan's personal librarian, who became one of the most powerful women in New York despite the dangerous secret she kept in order to make her dreams come true. From New York Times bestselling author Marie Benedict and acclaimed author Victoria Christopher Murray. 
In her 20s, Bella DaCosta Green is hired by J. Pierpoint Morgan to curate a collection of rare manuscripts, books, and artwork for his newly built Morgan Library. Bella becomes a fixture on the New York society scene and one of the most powerful people in the art and book world, known for her impeccable taste and shrewd negotiating for critical works as she helps build a world-class collection. But Bella has a secret, one she must protect at all costs. She was not born Bella DaCosta Green, but Bella Marion Greener. She is the daughter of Richard Greener, the first black graduate of Harvard and well-known advocate for equality. Belle's complexion isn't dark because of her alleged Portuguese heritage that lets her pass as white. Her complexion is dark because she's African-American. The personal librarian tells the story of an extraordinary woman famous for her intellect, style, and wit, and shares the length she must go for the protection of her family and her legacy to preserve her carefully crafted white identity in the racist world in which she lives. I... I'm so excited about this. Like I said, I I do enjoy historical fiction. It has to be, I've said it before, I prefer like spy thrillers and stuff like that in like Cold War um, type historical fiction. This one I'm interested in is specifically because I just read The Alienist last month, I think, or in April um, by Caleb Carr. And in that book, J.P. Morgan is a character in that book. Um, and he is a very... Um, quiet side character but he has a very domineering presence in the entire book like it's kind of understood that he pretty much runs New York um because of his wealth and things like that and so I am really excited to learn more um about this story um especially with the whole being able to pass as white like that's something that I'm trying to read a lot more about including um Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett that I still haven't read and I still want to read um, Passing by Nella Larson. Um, that's definitely on my TBR. I haven't, I don't have a copy of it, but I do want to get to that. So I'm really excited about this one as well. So now we are moving on to July and these are like all kinds of out of order, but they're all in July. So the first one that I'm really interested in is False Witness by Karen Slaughter. Um, I have quite a few Karen Slaughters. Where are they? Are they right? Oh, they're down here. You guys probably can't see them. Um, I have quite a few Karen Slaughters. I, the only one that I've read so far is the Good Daughter, um, but I'm interested in reading more of them. I just, I have to put myself um, in the right headspace to read Karen Slaughter because she, she, she does not hold back. <laughs> um, so, but I'm really excited about this one. Um, it is coming out on the 27th of July and it says, an ordinary life hides a devastating past, but now the past is catching up and time is running out. He saw what you did. He knows who you are. From the New York Times bestselling author of Pieces of Her and The Silent Wife, an electrifying standalone thriller. So it says, An Ordinary Life. Lee or Lay Collier has worked hard to build what looks like a normal life. She's an up-and-coming defense attorney at a prestigious law firm in Atlanta, would do anything for her 16-year-old daughter Maddie, and is managing to successfully co-parent through a pandemic after an uh, amicable separation from her husband Walter. Um, but Lay's ordinary life masks a childhood no one should have to endure, a childhood tarnished by secrets, broken by betrayal, and ultimately destroyed by a brutal act of violence. On a Sunday night at her daughter's school play, she gets a call from one of the firm's partners who wants Lee to come on board to defend a wealthy man accused of multiple counts of rape. Though wary of the case, it becomes apparent she doesn't have much choice if she wants to keep her job. They're scheduled to go to trial in one week. When she meets the accused face to face, she realizes that it's no coincidence that he specifically asked for her to represent him. She knows him and he knows her. More to the point, he may know what happened over 20 years ago and why Lee has spent two decades avoiding her past. Suddenly, she has a lot more to lose than in this case. The only person who can help her who can help is her younger estranged sister Callie, the last person Lee would ever want to drag into this after all they've been through. But with the life shattering truth in danger of being revealed, she has no choice. I am very, very excited. This gives me the good daughter vibes um, of two sisters that went through something in their past. They both have grown up and have built these lives that have basically they've tried to forget what happened in their past and then something happens that is bringing them back to it. I am excited. Again, I'm nervous. I have to put myself in the, my, the right mind space because Karen Slaughter is very graphic and detailed um, in her novels, especially when it comes to things like rape, which is like what this man is accused of, this client that she has to represent. Um, I would not be surprised if the big trauma in their past in, involved one or both of the sisters 
being raped as a child. And so, yeah, you have to just be very careful in being prepared for what she puts on page. But I'm still very, very excited to, to see that. I didn't even know that Karen Slaughter was coming out with another book. I don't keep up with her like that. Um, just as I was looking through books that were coming out, um, in this time frame that I'm looking at, I came across that one. So I am excited to see that. The next book that I am, I am excited about is The Stranger in the Mirror by Liv Constantine. This one is coming out on the 6th of July. Um, it says, a diabolically twisty, psychologically unsettling novel about a woman with no recollection of her past from the authors of the Reese Witherspoon book club pick, The Last Mrs. Parrish and The Wife Stalker. I think I have the last Mrs. Parrish on my shelf. Um, it says Addison's about to get married, but she's not looking forward to the big day. It's not her fiance. He's a wonderful man. It's because Addison doesn't know who she really is. A few years ago, a kind driver found her bleeding next to a New Jersey highway and rescued her. While her physical wounds healed, Addison's memory never returned. She doesn't know her real name or how she ended up injured on the side of a road or why she can't shake the notion that she may have done something very, very bad. In a posh home in the Boston suburbs, Julian tries to figure out what happened to his loving, caring wife, Cassandra, who disappeared without a trace two years ago. She would never have left him and their seven-year-old daughter, Valentina, of her own free will, or would she? As these two lives intersect, The Stranger in the Mirror hooks readers with riveting drama told with Liv Constantine's hallmark blend of glamour, tense, psych tense psychological thrills, and jaw-dropping twists. So, yes, I am always, <laughs> I am always here for any, um thrillers or psychological thrillers that have like cases of amnesia or lost memory or pretend lost memory um unreliable narrators in any way sense or form i'm definitely here for them um the next one that i am interested in is she who became the sun by shelly parker chan this one comes out on the 20th of july and this is the first in a series it's called the radiant emperor series um this is a um fantasy a historical fantasy um looks like it is queer as well um it says to to possess the mandate of heaven the female monk zoo will do anything it says mulan meets the song of achilles in a bold queer and lyrical reimagining of the rise of the founding emperor of the Ming dynasty from an amazing new voice in literary fantasy it says i refuse to be nothing in a famine stricken village on a dusty yellow plain two children are given two fates a boy greatness a girl nothingness in 1345, China lies under harsh Mongol rule. For the starving peasants of the Central Plains, greatness is something found only in stories. When the Zhu family's eighth-born son, Zhu Chongwa, is given a fate of greatness, everyone is mystified as to how it will come to pass. The fate of nothingness received by the family's clever and capable second daughter, on the other hand, is only as expected. When a bandit attack orphans the two children, though it is Zhu Chongwa who succumbs to despair and dies. Desperate to escape her own fated death, the girl uses her brother's identity to enter a monastery as a young male novice. There, propelled by her burning desire to survive, Zhu learns she is capable of doing whatever it takes, no matter how callous, to stay hidden from her fate. After her sanctuary is destroyed for supporting the rebellion against Mongol rule, Zhu uses the chance to claim another future altogether, her brother's abandoned greatness. So again, not typically my cup of tea, but after reading The Poppy War, which I cannot wait to finish that trilogy as well, I am really, really fascinated about learning more um, about um, Asian history, different time periods, different countries' history, especially in this historical fantasy realm. So I'm really, really looking forward to reading that one. The next one I'm looking forward to reading, which also comes out on the 20th of July. Yes, it's called The Book of Accidents by Chuck Wendig. This is horror. Um, it says, says a family returns to their hometown into the dark past that haunts them still in this masterpiece of literary horror by the New York Times bestselling author of Wanderers. Long ago, Nathan lived in a house in the country with his abusive father and has never told his family what happened there. Long ago, Maddie was a little girl making dolls in her bedroom when she saw something she shouldn't have and is trying to remember that lost trauma by making haunting sculptures. Long ago, something sinister, something hungry, walked in the tunnels and the mountains and the coal mines of their hometown in rural Pennsylvania. Now Nate and Maddie Graves are married and they have moved back to their hometown with their son Oliver. And now what happened long ago is happening again and it is happening to Oliver. 
He meets a strange boy who becomes his best friend, a boy with secrets of his own and a taste for dark magic. This dark magic puts them at the heart of a battle of good versus evil and a fight for the soul of the family and perhaps for all of the world. But the Graves family has a secret weapon in this battle, their love for one another. I came across this one because as um, we are, even though we're still, we're just now getting into summer, y'all, I'm already ready for fall. I'm ready for fall. For me, especially being in North Carolina, fall doesn't, I mean, fall date wise doesn't start until September anyway, but feeling like fall doesn't even start until like the end of September going into October here in North Carolina. But for me, once my kids are back in school, it is fall. Summer is over. Like I'm already putting out the pumpkin decorations and getting pumpkin spice lattes. Like I'm so ready for fall. I'm so ready for spooky season and to read all of the spooky horror books and ghost stories and vampires and all the things. And so this one definitely caught my eye for that reason. The next book that I'm really, really um, anticipating and really, really excited for is Wings of Shadow by Nikki Palpretto. This is book three in the Crown of Feathers series. This one is coming out on the 13th of July. I actually have pre-ordered a um, special edition from Illumicrate, I think. Either Illumicrate or Fairy Loot. I'm not sure. One of the two. Um, so I'm definitely interested, excited for that one to come out because I already have a copy coming. I do have books one and two in the Crown of Feather series, but I have not read them. So I'm just going to read the synopsis for book one because I'm not even looking at the synopsis for book three um, because I don't want to ruin myself. Um, but this um crown of feathers is kind of compared to an ember in the ashes so that was why i was interested in this one so the first book crown of feathers it says an ember in the ashes meets three dark crowns in this lush debut fantasy novel about a girl who disguises herself as a boy to join a secret group of warriors that ride phoenixes phoenixes into battle it says i had a sister once in a world ruled by fierce warrior queens a grand empire was built upon the backs of phoenix riders legendary heroes who soared through the sky on wings of fire until the war between two sisters ripped it all apart i promised her the throne would not come between us 16 years later veronica is a war orphan who dreams of becoming a phoenix rider from the stories of old after a shocking betrayal from her controlling sister veronica strikes out alone to find the riders even if that means disguising herself as a boy to join their ranks but it is a fact of life that one must kill or be killed rule or be ruled just as Veronica finally feels like she belongs, her sister turns up and reveals a tangled web of lies between them that will change everything. And meanwhile, the new empire has learned of the writer's return and intends to destroy them once and for all. It says sometimes the title of queen is given, sometimes it must be taken. Crown of Feathers is an epic fantasy about love's incredible power to save or to destroy. Interspersed throughout is the story of of Valkyria Ashfire, the last writer queen who would rather see her empire burn than fall into her sister's hand. Yeah, I, mm, I am not like a diehard dragon, like dragon and dragon ride. Like I know a lot of people who enjoy fantasy love dragons and love books that have dragon riders in them. But phoenixes, that's, that's a whole different thing, especially like the phoenix that is in Harry Potter. Like ever since Harry Potter, I've loved phoenixes. And so this one, we don't have dragon riders, we have phoenix riders, and I am here for all of it. So like I said, I found out, um, this is how excited I was, again, because it was compared to an Ember in the Ashes. I found out about the third book, I believe it's an Illumicrate um, special edition that I pre-ordered that, and then I went back and ordered the first two books in hardcover. So obviously they won't match the special edition, but they will all be hardcover. And so I'm excited to get started with that trilogy, I'm thinking. It's just going to be a trilogy or a series if there's going to be more books, but I'm excited to get started with that one at some point soon. The next book that I'm really, really interested in is Rise to the Sun by Leah Johnson. This one is coming out on July 6th. Um, I hope I have all these dates right. I believe they have been updated because I just like looked all these up a couple days ago. Um, Leah Johnson is the author of You Should See Me in a Crown. I have that book. I have not read it yet. Um, this one is also a queer YA contemporary. Um, it says, three days, two girls, one life-changing music festival. It says, Olivia is an expert at falling in love and at being dumped, but after the fallout from her last breakup has left her an outcast at school and at home, she's determined to turn over a new leaf. A crush-free weekend at Farmland Music and Arts Festival with her best friend is just what she needs to get her mind off the senior year that awaits her. Tony is one week away from starting college and is the last place she wants to be. 
Unsure about who she wants to become and still reeling in the wake of the loss of her musician turned roadie father, she's heading back to the music festival that changed his life in hopes that following in his footsteps will help her find her own way forward. When the two arrive at farmland, the last thing they expect is to realize that they'll need to join forces in order to get what they're searching for out of the weekend. As they work together, the festival becomes so much more complicated than they bargained for, and Olivia and Tony will find that they need each other and music more than they ever could have imagined. Music festival. <laughs> you had me at music festival. I love music. Um, I love music festivals, and um, like I'm one of those that wish I could have gone to Woodstock. I wish I was like around in the time of Woodstock. But yeah, anyways, so I love music festivals, and I am... I'm still really, really excited to get to You Should See Me in a Crown. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. Um, I may, like, when this one comes out, get it and maybe read the two of them together. I'm not sure, but I'm really, really excited about this one coming out. The next one is coming out on the 13th of July, and that is The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. I'm reading The Final Girls right now by Riley Sager, and this one I have been anticipating for a hot minute. Um, but this one, it says, a fast-paced, thrilling horror novel that follows a group of heroines to die for, from the brilliant New York Times best-selling author of The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which I'm also currently reading right now. Um, in horror movies, the final girl is the one who's left standing when the credits roll, the one who fought back, defeated the killer, and avenged her friends, the one who emerges bloodied but victorious, but after the sirens fade and the audience moves on, what happens to her? Lynette Tarkington is a real-life final girl who survived the massacre 22 years ago and it has defined every day of her life since. And she's not alone. For more than a decade, she's been meeting with five other actual final girls and their therapists in a support group for those who survived the unthinkable, putting their lives back together piece by piece. That is until one of the women misses a meeting and Lynette's worst fears are realized. Someone knows about the group and is determined to take their lives apart again piece by piece. But the thing about these final girls is that they have each other now and no matter how bad the odds, how dark the night, how sharp the knife, they will never ever give up. So I, like I said, I've been interested in this one for a hot minute. I am currently reading Final Girls by Riley Sager and The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. So I'm really, really excited. And I think that um, this one will, I think I will enjoy it even more because Final Girls will be fresh in my mind and that whole vibe of Final Girl. So the next one is coming out on the 20th of July. There's a lot of good books coming out in July. This one's coming out on the 20th of July and this is For Your Own Good by Samantha Downing. This one is a thriller and I think Samantha Downing only writes thriller but this one is a thriller. Um, it says USA Today bestselling author Samantha Downing is back with her latest sneaky thriller set at a prestigious private school complete with interfering parents, over eager students, and one teacher who just wants to teach them all a lesson. Teddy Crutcher has won Teacher of the Year at the esteemed Belmont Academy, home to the best and brightest. He says his wife couldn't be more proud, though no one has seen her in a while. Teddy really can't be bothered with the death of a school parent that's looking more and more like murder or the student digging a little too deep into Teddy's personal life. His main focus is on pushing these kids to their full academic potential. All he wants is for his colleagues and the endlessly meddlesome parents to stay out of his way. It's really too bad that sometimes excellence can come at such a high cost. I, I'm not like thinking this is going to be a five star or anything. You guys know how I feel about thrillers right now anyway, but I'm just really, really excited. First of all, it said private school, so private school, prep schools, boarding schools, buzzwords for me. Um, but just that one line, what really drew me in is just this one line. He says his wife couldn't be more proud, though no one has seen her in a while. <laughs> like what so yeah I'm excited for that one um I don't know this is one of those ones where I don't know I don't think I'm gonna buy it I'm probably gonna try to check it out from my library and read it and see if I like it and then buy it maybe but I I doubt it like just the way that I'm feeling about it right now I don't think it's one that I'm gonna buy it's gonna be one that I check out from the library and read but I am interested in reading it okay so now we're getting into August and the first one comes out on the 3rd of August this is The Dead in the Dark by Courtney Gould Gold I know it's not gold I think it's Gould not sure this is a YA thriller um and it is queer it looks like um, says Courtney Gould's thrilling YA debut, The Dead in the Dark, is about the things that lurk in dark corners, the parts of you that, the parts of you that can't remain hidden, and about finding home in places and people you didn't expect. Um, I've heard about this one now that I'm remembering. Um, I've heard quite a few people talking about it that had um, arcs of it. 
Um, it says the dark has been waiting for far too long, has been waiting for far too long, and it won't stay hidden any longer. Something is wrong in Snakebite, Oregon. Teenagers are disappearing, some turning up dead. The weather isn't normal, and all fingers seem to point to TV's most popular ghost hunters who have just returned to town. Logan Ortiz Woodley, a daughter of TV's Paraspectors, has never been snakebite before, but the moment she and her dad's she and her dads arrive, so I think that's where the clear is, she has two dads, um, she starts to get the feeling that there's more secrets buried here than they originally let on. Ashley Barton's boyfriend was the first teen to go missing, and she's felt his presence ever since. But now that the Ortiz Woodleys are in town, his ghost is following her, and the only person Ashley can trust is the mysterious Logan. When Ashley and Logan team up to figure out who or what is haunting Snakebite, their investigation reveals truths about the town, their families, and themselves that neither of them are ready for. As the danger intensifies, they realize that their growing feelings for each other could be a light in the darkness. Okay, so we looks like we have a male male romance because she the one of the main characters has two dads, but it also looks like we may be having a female female romance between our two main characters, Logan and Ashley. So I am excited again. I'm I'm here for all of the ghost stories right about now. The next one that I'm interested in it comes out on the 17th of August. Um, I obviously will have the cover up here. I'm a little confused. So the title I think is Me Moth and Moth is in parentheses, but I've seen it with me in parentheses and then Moth separate. I'm not sure how exactly to pronounce the title like or how exactly it's supposed to be, but this one is by Amber, uh, Amber McBride. This is a fantasy, a YA fantasy romance and it's written in verse. Um, this is, it says a debut YA novel in verse by Amber, Mc, Amber McBride. Me Moth is about a teen girl who is grieving the deaths of her family and a teen boy who crosses her path. It says Moth has lost her family in an accident. Though she lives with her aunt, she feels alone and uprooted until she meets Sonny, a boy who is also searching for his roots. If he knows more about where he comes from, maybe he'll be able to understand his ongoing depression. And if Moth can help him feel grounded, then perhaps she too will discover the history she carries in her bones. Moth and Sonny take a road trip that has them chasing ghosts and searching for ancestors. The way each moves forward is surprising, powerful, and unforgettable. Here's an exquisite and uplifting novel about identity, first love, and the ways that our memories and our roots steer us through the universe. Um, this one I was drawn to um, specifically because it's written in verse. Um, after reading A Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds, I am really wanting to read more books written in verse. So I'm trying to find more. So if you have recommendations for uh, novels written in verse, let me know in the description box below, please. But that is the main reason why I am um, attracted to this one. And besides, the cover is absolutely stunning i i love butterflies i know butterflies and moths are different but i love the cover i love her locks and i'm in the process of starting my locks so yes i'm very very excited to read this one this one i will probably even though i'm not sure how much i will enjoy it i will probably buy it just as a cover buy because i love that cover the next one that i want to read is phantom heart by kelly Crea Crea Cree. Um, this one comes out on the 17th of August. Um, this is a YA romance and this one I'm excited for. I'm a little nervous about. So this one says a steamy YA romance with twilight vibes inspired by Gaston LaRue's classic The Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera is on my 21 books to read in 2021 so I will probably wait to read that one and read it right around the same time. Also funny thing I told you guys I read the, the first book Twilight for the first time last year and it was the first time I read the book first time I'd seen the movie um Twilight is <laughs> James from James Spade's favorite series um although they like to admit how much trash it is they still love it and starting in July James and I are going to be buddy reading the entire Twilight series I don't know how I got sucked into this on the live show <laughs> this past weekend but yeah we will be buddy reading the entire Twilight series starting in July. I'm pretty sure we're going to do one book a month. Um, we're going to probably be doing some live streams and putting up some extra videos and like really going in depth with it and talking about all the problematic things and the trash that it is. But we're going to have a great time doing it. So this is going to be very, very fitting for me to read this as well. But um, yeah, so Phantom Heart. And I'm loving this cover. This cover reminds me very much of... Um, 
you should see me in a crown. Like I'm just really loving these covers that have like these almost like handwritten text and like this I like I can design something like this and procreate and so it just it just has a vibe. But um, it says 17 year old Stephanie Armand doesn't believe in ghosts or spirits. Despite her six year old sister Charlie insisting a masked figure is hiding in her closet and the rumors at school, Stephanie isn't convinced her father's latest renovation project, a crumbling Victorian mansion, houses the soul of a monster. So when the very charming and paranormal obsessed Lucas Cheney takes an interest in both Stephanie and her notorious home, Mo Moldavia? Moldavia, I think. The supernatural and romantic activity escalates to an all-time high, and that doesn't even take into account the dashing, British-accented 18-year-old boy Eric, who's taken up residence in Stephanie's nightly dreams, a boy who may have something to do with the man in the mask and the strange occurrences taking place at Moldavia. So, I can already feel, especially if it's saying Twilight vibes, that there's going to be some kind of love triangle, and I don't know if I'm going to be feeling it or not. We'll see, but I am really, really 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 excited to read this one and like I said I will be in the middle of a twilight read along with James and I will save the Phantom of the Opera and read that right before I read this so that I can pick up on some of those Phantom of the Opera um, clues and vibes and I don't feel lost. Okay so now we are getting into September. The very first book that is coming out in September that I absolutely cannot wait for is The Hawthorne Legacy by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is the second book in the Inheritance Games series I will say for now. I don't know how many books are going to be in this series. I have already pre-ordered it. Cannot wait for it to get here. This one is coming out on the 7th of September. Yeah the 7th of September um, and I, like I've read the synopsis for this because I've already read the first book but I am not going to spoil this synopsis if you have not read The Inheritance Games. Basically the first book The Inheritance Games we follow um our main character Avery. She is um an orphan if you will. Her um her dad has never been in her life. Her mom passed away recently. She does have a half sister on her dad's side that is an adult that takes her in. I think Avery is about 16 or so um and so they are just kind of struggling financially and Avery just wants to get through school and get a scholarship and, and go away and start over her life um she is summoned to this wealthy man's house in Texas and she finds out this like ultra billionaire and she finds out at the reading of the will that he has basically left all of his money to her she doesn't know who this man is. She doesn't know why he left her all of his money, all of his family. He has basically disinherited and they are all like, who is this chick? What is going on? Um, the condition of Avery getting this money is that she has to move into his mansion uh, in Texas and live there for a year. The only catch with that is his family. So his two daughters and then his four grandsons that he has just cut off are also still living there and so it has just it was so much fun there are clues and riddles so this man he was known for creating these like elaborate clues and riddles and games for his grandsons and there are all these clues and riddles that are left behind and Avery is trying to figure out the clues the grandsons are trying to figure out the clues sometimes with her sometimes against her to figure out why their granddad did what they did the first book ended on such a cliffhanger and there is someone from Avery's life before she found out about this reading of the will that may have the clue as to why this man left her all of this money and yeah I am I'm just so excited about it. I would be like tickled pink if there are more books in this series. Um, like I said I feel like this second book is going to wrap up that main overarching mystery so I don't know if there's going to be anything for a third book to do but we shall see but I'm really really excited for it. The next book that I'm interested in this one comes out on the 14th of September and this is White Smoke by Tiffany D. Jackson. Tiffany D. Jackson wrote Roan that I have read. Um, she also wrote Allegedly Monday's Not Coming. I think she has quite a few others. I have Allegedly and Monday's Not Coming. I haven't gotten to those ones yet but I'm really excited about this one because this one is a YA horror and again I'm just feeling horror vibes right now. So this one says yet again get out. I'm telling you I'm so tired of hearing books 
compared to Get Out, but we'll see how it goes. So this one says The Haunting of Hill House meets Get Out in this chilling YA psychological thriller and modern take on the classic haunted house story from New York Times bestselling author Tiffany D. Jackson. It says Marigold is running from ghosts. The phantoms of her old life keep haunting her, but a move with her newly blended family from their small California beach town to the embattled Midwestern city of Cedarville might be the fresh start she needs. Her mom has accepted a new job with the Sterling Foundation that comes with a free house, one that Mari now has to share with her bratty 10-year-old stepsister Piper. The renovated picture-perfect home on Maple Street, sitting between dilapidated houses surrounded by wary neighbors, has its secrets. That's only half the problem. Household items vanish, doors open on their own, lights turn off, shadows walk past rooms, voices can be heard in the walls, and there's a foul smell seeping through the vents only Mari seems to notice. Worse, Piper keeps talking about a friend who wants Mari gone. But running from ghosts is just a metaphor, right? As the house closes in, Mari learns that the danger isn't limited to Maple Street. Cedarville has its secrets too, and secrets always find their way through the cracks. I am so excited. I have um, The Haunting of Hill House. I think I watched that movie a long time ago, but I don't remember anything about it. I do have a physical copy of it that I will be reading... I believe the first week of July for Summerween. So stay tuned for a Summerween uh, TBR video. But yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited about that one. I again, tired of the whole get out comparison, but we will see. Okay, so we have two more left. They both come out on the 7th of September. The first one is Among Thieves by MJ Kuhn. Um, this one says a thrilling fantasy debut, a high stakes heist novel set in a gritty world of magic and malice and perfect for fans of Six of Crows. In just over a year's time, Rhea, I think, or Raya Cotella has already earned herself a reputation as the quickest, deadliest blade in the dockside city of Carrollwood, not to mention the sharpest tongue, but I want to say Raya, but Raya Cotella is not her real name. For the past six years, a deadly secret has kept her in hiding, running from town to town, doing whatever it takes to stay one step ahead of the formidable guildmaster, the sovereign ruler of the five kingdoms of the Moor. No matter how far or fast she travels, his servants never fail to track her down, but even the most powerful men can be defeated. Raya's path now leads directly into the heart of the Guildmaster stronghold and against every instinct she has, it's not a path she can walk alone. Forced to team up with a crew of assorted miscreants, smugglers, and thieves, Raya must plan her next moves very carefully. If she succeeds, her freedom is won once and for all. But unfortunately for Raya, her new allies are nearly as selfish as she is and they all have plans of their own. So, I am very very excited i have not read six of crows i've heard great things about it i want to read it i don't want to read um six of crows the duology without reading the um shadow and bone trilogy i cannot think about that without reading the shadow and bone trilogy first and i'm not super excited to read shadow and bone like i'm not super drawn to it so please let me know in the comments if you know can i read the six of crows duology and not read shadow and bone um, or will it mess things up for me? But I'm just, I'm not really drawn to Shadow and Bone trilogy, but I do want to read the Six of Crows duology. So I'm really excited to see this, um, compared to that. I also want to read The Lies of Locke Lamora. I've heard great things about that, about it being a high story, about a band of miscreants. So I'm really, really excited because I love morally gray characters. I love I love villains and being the main characters as well and so I like more really great characters and when you have a whole group of them that all are teaming up or banding up to complete this one mission but they own have their own selfish motives like I am so here for it so I'm very very excited about that one and it's fairly short it looks like it's 352 pages so it's not long I don't see anything that says it will be Part of a series so I'm not 100% sure on that one and the last one um, that again is also coming out on the 7th of September is my most anticipated release of this year like even more so than Survive the Night. I tried to get an arc of this on NetGalley and I was not approved for it but this is No Gods No Monsters. This is the first in the Convergence saga so this is a dark fantasy um, that I am just really, really excited about. So it says, one October morning, Lena gets the news that her brother was shot and killed by Boston cops. But what 
But what looks like a case of police brutality soon reveals something much stranger. Monsters are real and they want everyone to know it. As creatures from myth and legend come out of the shadows seeking safety through visibility, their emergence sets off a chain of seemingly unrelated events. Members of a local werewolf pack are threatened into silence. A professor follows a missing French trail of breadcrumbs to a mysterious secret society. Y'all know how I feel about secret societies. And a young boy with unique abilities seeks refuge in a pro-monster organization with secrets of its own. Meanwhile, more people start disappearing, suicides and hate crimes increase, and protests erupt globally, both for both for and against the monsters. At the center is a mystery no one thinks to ask. Why now? What has frightened the monsters out of the dark? The world will soon find out. I, mm, I am so excited. Like I said, this is my most anticipated release of this entire year. Like I said, I tried, when I first got on NetGalley, I think back in February or so, I tried to get an arc um, of this and I was denied for it. Um, but like I said, I was just new to NetGalley. I need to do better with my net galley and keeping up with reading those books and getting my ratings up. I don't know if I'm going to try to request an arc again, but I will definitely be buying this when it comes out. I am so excited, so excited for that one. So those are my 18 books that I am most excited about and anticipating um, for the summer. Let me know if you are anticipating any of those, if there are any others that I did not mention that are coming out in this time period that you are really looking forward to. Give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you have not already, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.